Hi, this is Book Circle Online. I'm Jeffrey Masters, and I'm here today with actress Ileana Douglas talking about her memoir, I Blame Dennis Hopper. Stay tuned. This is Book Circle Online, featuring in-depth discussion, insight, news, and commentary on all the world's leading book titles and their authors. And now, Book Circle Online. Hey, Ileana. Hi there. Nice to be here. Thank you. Welcome to our show. Thank you. Thanks Absolutely. I can't tell you how much I enjoyed your book. Oh, thank you. That means a lot. Yeah. I know it's being billed as a memoir, yes. but I really think that it's an, like, an important documentation of film history. Oh, thank you. Yeah. I, I, I uh, almost... I'm starting to do a movie podcast myself, and yeah. one of the things that I'm going to do is I've kept journals my whole film career, and yeah. it was a great go-to uh, when I was writing the book because I've always felt that way. I sort of call myself a, a rememberer and very early on I got to know uh, this actor who I, I really admire, Roddy McDowell, and he said, you're going to meet a lot of interesting people. I'm one of them. <laughs> Start writing. And he gave me my first journal and I, you know, and I, I do feel like it's an, a, a document of film history. Yeah. And just the your love for the movie making process. I love it. I didn't realize how that was missing from other memoirs I've read. Well, it's funny you say that because I love, I mean, I love juicy memoirs and celebrity autobiographies but I the ones that stick with me are the ones about the movie making process you know every time when I'm reading a book and I for my work for Turner I read a lot of memoirs and it's always like well what happened in you know American in Paris okay you got the part but then what what, tell me about the dance sequences. Yeah. Tell me what the director was like. So I wanted to focus a lot about the experience of what's it like shooting on a mountain when you're up 12,000 feet in the air and, you know, you've been contracted to lose 15 pounds and, you know, all of those experiences or, or you know, keep fear to die for, some of the yeah. technical aspects, emotional aspects that are going yeah, on. Yeah, and I, I love the moment in New York City where you're wearing your New York hat, you got uh, it, and you're just saying, stop, everybody stop, look at what we're doing. Yeah. That's amazing to me. It was a great moment and I have that photograph in the book and on my desk of the director Glenn Gordon Karen the movie was picture perfect and I literally did the movie because it was shooting in New York City and so I've been I was like I've been traveling all over I've never done a movie actually in New York and I was such a fan of those kind of movies like career you know the best of everything career gal moves to New York and has like a ill-tempered boss and she gets ahead and the script sort of had those aspects of it and working with Jennifer Aniston but yes we were it was a very challenging movie to shoot for a variety of reasons it was like a starring vehicle for Jennifer and there was sorts of dramas the things going on behind the set script changes etc cetera, etc cetera. so so we were behind but i mean i couldn't believe it it was like one day i'm a little kid with my grandmother you know watching them shoot dog day afternoon and we're behind the bleachers and i had this epiphany that here we were in times square you know a warm spring night warm people coming home from work bleachers, people set up, people screaming, Jennifer Aniston there, you know, friends, and I just said to the director, and he was so harried about, like, how are we going to do this, we're behind, we're losing the light, and costing thousands, of I said, Glenn, look at us, we're shit, we're in the bleach, we're inside, they're all outside the bleachers, we're inside the bleachers, and it was a great, and I literally did. I made I made the cameraman come over. He took pictures of me and Jennifer, and there's just joy on our faces. Yeah, you know? I mean, it was so much fun too. Reading, like the trajectory of your life, everything makes sense. You know, <laughs> like I, you know, don't you have like friends from high school where you're like, oh, that's what their life ended up like? Yes. Uh, like, yes. I don't know if you're misrepresenting, but it seems like if people from your youth would hear about your life now, they would say, oh yeah. Absolutely. But well, maybe when I was dressing in crazy costumes like Elton <laughs> John, or you know, maybe then they didn't. I don't know what's in store for her. But uh, but uh, yes, hopefully now it'll it, it all be, it all makes sense. It's always I always think of myself as someone who has kind of stumbled sort towards success a little bit. You know, it's I enjoyed. I've tried to enjoy the journey as much as the the film career itself because you can't just rest on your laurels and I've really enjoyed 
the experience. I always, every movie for me is the experience of doing the film and then the experience of making the film and the relationships and the things I learned on that film. And I've, and I've always gone into it and I think that does come from my grandfather, that experience of like, well, what am I gonna learn from this director? What am I gonna learn from this experience? Yeah, you've been on so many famous film sets of iconic films. Do you have a sense of that while you're shooting? Like, oh, this is gonna be a big deal? I, you know, I, di I definitely did on, to give you an example, a movie like Goodfellas. I, I never thought it would be this iconic, you know, looking back on it now, and it's just, it's almost a part of the culture. But in those days, uh, you were contracted, I mean, at a very small part in the movie, but you would be contracted for basically the run of the picture. You know, you'd get like a day player rate for six weeks and you'd be there. So a, a, a scene in a wedding would maybe take a week to shoot or, you know, the shooting a bar scene, even though you weren't, even though you talked maybe only one day, you'd be there for a week. Like, so you'd be what you'd be part of the crowd. I mean, if you look at the movie Goodfellas, there are enormous crowds. There's people. I mean, I remember a scene where I wasn't even on camera. I was in the next room. And but we were there, we were paid for the run of the picture to sort of create a kind of ambient atmosphere. Oh, and that's fascinating. Yeah. And so I and even when I wasn't shooting because I was, you know, in a relationship with uh, Marty, I would just go to the he'd say, oh, you, you got to come down, you know, today we're doing something kind of interesting. And so I, you know, just went to the set every day just to watch and to and to learn. Yeah, that must make the family atmosphere so much tighter compared to today. Oh, it was it was incredible. You, you know, I wrote about this in the book. The the atmosphere. I mean, there were the scene. One of the scenes that I was in, uh, which was took place in a bar. I'm not sure if we were in Brooklyn or where we were, but it was the scene where uh, De Niro is yelling at the guy for, you know, buying the pink Cadillac and is the actor's name is Johnny Roast Beef. And as I wrote in the book, they couldn't open the door far enough. You know, the scene is that they open the door and you see the pink Cadillac and the camera comes back. They could only open the door a certain amount of people way because if they opened it any further, everybody would start screaming because there were thousands of people. Hey, Bobby, hey, uh, you know. And every time we'd walk out of this scene, just being in the movie, people were like, yeah, have a sandwich. Yeah, you want some wine? You know, like people were outside barbecuing. And th this is Goodfellas, right? Yeah. So this is before Goodfellas was even Goodfellas. Yeah. They hadn't seen it. Yeah. This was like the fa talk about you know the family atmosphere to the extreme <laughs> is that we were in these neighborhoods like hey they're in gonna they're gonna be in Coney Island now you know we were they were in different parts of the borough you know and it was. And, you know, Robert De Niro was, I, th I think he still is, is just, you know, he was a god in terms of New York, in terms of him, you know, the idea that the guys from Raging Bull were reuniting, I, I, don't, I think, and I tried to write about that. I mean, as much as Goodfellas has become a part of the lexicon, that the, the troika of Marty, Bob, and Joe Pesci reuniting from Raging Bull, I think was at the heart of what got everybody so excited about that film. Oh, I gotcha. And you, you much of your career has been in front of the camera, but you also had like a first rate education working with Marty and in the editing room and hearing about it and, and everything. Yeah, I was, I mean, again, I was very lucky that from a young age, you know, my, my grandfather and invited me to the set of, you know, being there. It's like, it's only been, it's only, it's, I started at the top. So, you know, it just that I was always fascinated by behind the scenes and watching things and that how, how, how the director makes things, how the director um, creates a performance. And again, what I learned on the set of being there was this idea that it was amazing watching Peter Sellers and my grandfather, but it was also amazing sitting next to Hal Ashby and listening to secret things that he was saying uh, to the script supervisor. Oh, that was good. Okay, when he did that, that was good. And the actors didn't know about that. So I thought 
that was fascinating too. And my grandfather was always pushing me towards writing. Now, I don't really know why. Maybe he thought acting was sort of more heartbreaking, but he felt I had so had real talent as a writer. I used to try to be funny and write him little stories and letters and things. So he always was pushing me in that way. So I always felt slightly guilty about being an actor because I knew my grandfather really wanted me to be a writer. Wait, uh, jumping to the very end of the book, the very mm. last page you write that I want to be a director. Yes. It's, is that like what you're like only you're like pursuing at the moment? Yeah, I think that um, I think that I always was a natural director in terms of I mean going all the way back to being a kid and and creating little scenarios and stories and dressing up and in a sense it was you know my own auteur. You know? Do you think it's a gender thing that were you like born and working today you would say I can be a director whereas it wasn't an option? Then? Yes I agree I absolutely agree I mean I took I, it's such a crazy route of I went to when I went to acting school uh, it was, you know, you were, you could be an actress and that's how you gained your power. But so I don't think that, um, you know, I would have had probably the confidence. I, I wanted to be a director and certainly I've been on enough sets where people are like, stop directing. Stop directing, Ileana, just act. Well, isn't it the director in you that let you do the laughing during the famous Cape Fear scene? Yeah, I always, you know, again, you know, Marty, is, he sort of, you know, blessed me and cursed me at the same time because he gave me such confidence starting from, you know, the set of Goodfellas where he invited me into the editing room and, went, you know, like, I was looking at scenes and what do you think of this? And he, I mean, I just thought it was incredible. I was like, well, I, I think this is two frames too long or this, you know, and they would, they would, you know, listen to my opinions about things. And so again, when we did Cape Fear and I had certain ideas about things, they, they took them up and, you know, and then we were shooting them. I mean, some, so I had friends from acting school who'd see the movie and they go, do people know that you're not, you're just taking things you did in acting class and sort of transposing them and putting them in the Yeah, I, I mean, the laughing is like straight up Meisner. Yeah. You know, do exactly what you're it, not expected to do. Yeah. Or to surprise yourself. Yeah, the movie Cape Fear is a textbook example of Meisner, yeah. you know, uh, Meisner technique. And in fact, that was, I even write about how I went there to the set and I got myself in trouble because I was really just waiting for Robert De Niro and Marty to give me brilliant direction that would carry me through. And preparation really was not my strong suit in school. I always liked to be the doer. But in that film, I had to literally stop everything, go back to my trailer, do a preparation, go back to acting school, like be, you know, use technique. And thank God I had some technique to yeah. rely on. And you studied directly with Sandy Meisner? Yes. Wow. I know it sounds like, it's so funny because I have contemporaries and I'm uh, good friends with this wonderful actor, Chris Noth, who we all know, Mr. Big. And he went to the neighborhood playhouse, but and he's a little older than me. But he did not study with Sanford Meisner because <sighs> I, for for whatever reason, when Meisner was there, maybe he was he was out sick. But in the years that I was at the neighborhood playhouse, which is 1984 and 1985, I had an uh, I had three amazing teachers: Sanford Meisner, another uh, man who's now gone, named Phil Gushy, just a great great teacher. Learned so much from him and then Richard Pinter. And those three people um, really just changed my life and really, they they not only made me a better actor, they made me a better human being. Wow. Uh, I just think it's so interesting with acting techniques that today they're still, like that was brand new when you were learning it. Yes. Today they're still teaching Meisner and they're still teaching Stanislavski yes. and you know Strasbourg. There's been not anything quote unquote new that's like taken a hold. No, it's it's interesting. You, you go back to the group theater, which is what we, you know, which is where everything sort of begins. The group theater, which is uh, Harold Clerman, Stella Adler, um, and then uh, Lee Strasberg. And then they have this split, you know, uh, uh, Stella Adler meets with the Stanislavski people in Paris, and then she comes back and she says they're doing it all wrong. And then, so they have this split. And so it's interesting in terms of those what the actor studio became and then what the neighborhood playhouse came and then the people that are in between that are you know if you look at different actors 
uh, like Warren Beatty credits Stella Adler, Marlon Brando credits Stella Adler, and then you have other actors that are specifically actor studio, and then you have some actors like Jeff Goldblum, Diane Keaton, Robert Duvall, and they're very much Meisner. But I don't know if, again, you know, when I do movies lately, I don't know if people really even understand what those techniques uh, mean. They're they're so derivative. Yeah. You know? I, I mean, like, I studied Meisner in college, and I had to think, like, how much has this been butchered? For, yes. Because it was, like, the third generation of teachers. I, that, would be, that would be really interesting. Since I studied specifically with Sandy Meisner, it'd be really interesting yeah. to go into a class and go, wait, that Like, I wonder nuts. if you saw repetitions today, if you would say, that's, that's not what Sandy meant. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Because, again, the whole idea of repetition was so crucial for somebody like me because it made you not self-conscious. Everything was about the other person. So therefore you didn't have to conjure up being sad or you just had to work off of the other uh, person and without um, you know putting any kind of bias on it or you just had to really, oh, you seem intrigued, <laughs> giving yeah. you some repetition. <laughs> so, uh, but I loved it. I mean, I for me, it was the key to everything. I really enjoyed, you know, I really enjoyed it. it changed my acting for sure, and it cha I think it changed me in again in my real, my real uh, life because I my had a wonderful teacher Richard Pinter, Richard Pinter, who was saying because I had a tendency to always want to be funny, and I'd come out of doing musical theater and you know doing lots of like gags and turning towards the audience, and he cured me of a lot of that tendency he used to always say dare to be dull dare to be dull oh really because he'd say you're not because you're not dull just just be you don't have to like goose it right i wrote about an example in goodfellas where here i am i'm in the movie i'm in the movie there's nothing more i need to do the hard part is over and yet when the camera comes to me, I, I, I think to myself, oh, man, I'm going to be so clever. I'm going to do this Eve Arden kind of like button the scene with a drink and a glass of wine and like wah, wah. And it just was terrible, you know. And, but, but how amazing for like the almighty Martin Scorsese to cut and say technical difficulties, not Ileana. Yeah. That was not good. Oh, my God. It was an amazing because, you know, we had this scene as I write about literally like 100 people I think in the scene and the camera's tracking and you know I know that at a certain point when the camera gets on me I'm going to have to talk and I have I all I have to say is which I've talked about before the hardest thing in the world is just to have one line oh absolutely because it's like the Seinfeld episode you know where he says these, pretz these pretzels are making me thirsty but so I said if he catches me with anyone he'll kill me and so when the camera got to me I had the split second decision to be Eve Arden and have my glass of wine and go if he catches me with anyone he'll kill me and it was just like as soon as it came out of my mouth I said oh my god that's the worst acting and and Martin Scorsese, bless his heart, was tech cut, cut, technical. And I knew, I mean, I knew it was me. I knew without right. a doubt. And that image of him going through the crowd of a hundred people, getting to the bar, whispering in my ear, he goes, don't, uh, don't do that again. And I said, I know, I know. And like, that's like such a generous thing to do, but also on like a person to person basis, had he embarrassed you, you would have mm -hmm. been devastated and not been able to oh, complete the scene. Trust me, I've been on other films <laughs> where the director is at the monitor and you can hear them in the other room. What is she do? What is she doing? Why is she doing that? Oh, I hate, what, what's happening? Oh, you know? no. And you have to, you have to be able to do that too. And that's hard. You know, it's hard not to personalize things because you want to be, you know, you want to be liked. Yeah. And then also as a director and as a director myself, you know, it is so hard when somebody, you clearly see somebody come up to you and it's all neuroses. They've got 80 neuroses about something. I don't, what is this blazer is, what, why am I wearing plaid? And the, I don't like my hair. And it's, and you know, and the clock is ticking and you somehow have to find a way to communicate with them what you want, but also to make them happy. And I think, again, a lot of that training comes from watching, um, great directors you know like marty like gus van zandt yeah. just quiet just very calm i've never seen 
uh, great dire directors scream at someone and get a good performance. I think that that's a myth. Hmm. And when people try to do, when people have tried to do that with me, I freeze up. It never works. Never had a great experience of people. It, it, there's a myth that they go, I'm going to screw with this person's head and they're going to do something. I, I don't, we're, you know, we're, our animal instincts know that something is wrong and I think we freeze up. Yeah, that never works. Um, speaking of Marty, I think that your quote unquote big break of uh -huh. being the girl in the office and getting a call to come and scream for Marty. Yes. If that was written in a movie, I'd say this is so dumb. I know. <laughs> I, I know. My whole life is like that, pretty much. <laughs> like a bad script. Yeah, I was like, it is. I cannot it's believe like, this is happening. Like a story that a publicist made up and then later planted in page six, which she did. Yes. Uh, yeah, I was working for a film publicist because I have encyclopedic knowledge of film. And I, I often joke, you know, that the only reason I got the job is because I, my, the special skill set I had, which was knowing that Adolph Green was married to Phyllis Newman, but that she was not his writing partner. It, uh, you know, that Betty Conn and was not his wife, but his writing partner. Those were the kind of special skills you need in publicity so that you know you know who's who, you know who Frank Rich is, you know who David Denby is, you know, uh, you know who everybody is, what their last five projects are, who their wives are, who their girlfriends are. I fi finally I found I had a special skill for knowing all those things and I got that job. But through a random comic by doing a play in school where I played someone that was murdered and the director told me I had a great scream, blood curdling scream that's how I uh, that resume made its way to Marty again because of this other insane story of Frank Perry who I really owe everything to and the movie Hello Again right? Of they that they literally and I, these, I guess these things do happen they forgot to cast someone and he came running in the office and he said uh, you, you're an actress right? And I, and I literally said yes act, yeah, I'm an actress who answers the phones yes <laughs> and uh, he said come in my office I may have a part for you and so we oh my god yeah and like had this been a year later, you would not have been in that office. You probably by then would have crossed off screaming on your resume. That wouldn't have been there. It's so interesting because again, I knew I, you know, every day when I walked through the halls of the Brill building, I knew that something important was going to happen to me, regardless of whether it did or not. I think that when you're starting out, you really do have to believe in things like that. Now I had, you know, I had my two songs prepared. I could do a few dance moves. I could fence. You know, you have to believe, you have to be, I, I say this all, when people always ask me for advice, I say my only advice is to be employable 24 hours a day. And that is, you can't be like, uh, I, give me a minute. It's like, no, you don't have a minute. It's like, hey, is there anyone here that can tap dance? Hey, I can tap dance. So I always feel like with actors, you know, they get lazy, they get complacent. You have to have a skill set. You know what I mean? You have to be able to whip out of your pocket the ability to, what, I mean, you, you're not working. Memorize a poem, memorize a monologue. Yeah. I find too that my actor friends that they get in trouble because they're studying acting and they're an actor. And I'm like, but you need to have like a whole other life. Yeah. Like if find something else you're passionate about and well, be it's, smart. <laughs> it's very hard because I think that when you're in school and I was in acting school, it's such a safe haven that it's like <laughs> the real world is very ugly and then filled with rejection. So it's a lot easier to just be in your little safe haven, you know, yeah. and certainly for all the times I've done, I've had positive experiences. I've also gone in and been, you know, doing a scene and crying and having the director like walk away from me and take a phone call you know so and so you know and you're like well, I thought I was doing really well what, <laughs> what happened you know? right, right. <laughs> um, we have to talk about the title yes it's called I Blame Dennis Hopper yes. are you sick of telling the story yet no I'm not okay. because anytime I get a chance to 
talk about Dennis Hopper, who was really a mystic and who changed my life. And I should really say that the book is, it's not a career book, as you had mentioned. Uh, it's a series of it, stories about a movie or a movie star who profoundly changed my life. And, and, and not, if I can cut you off, not yeah. a movie or a movie star, like the most important movie stars and movies. Oh. Marlon Brando and Ilya Kazan. And, yeah. Yeah, Peter I, Sellers, and and it begins with Dennis Hopper, yeah. with my parents seeing the movie, which is the power of film, seeing the movie Easy Rider, and my father became just obsessed with this film, as other people did in 1969. It was you know this game changing type of a uh, film, and uh, he ended up leaving his job and starting a commune called the Studio. And starting a band, and you know, we and your and, mom went along with it. And my mom, my Italian Catholic mom, like totally went around, uh, 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 you know, about about. She became the hippie mom, and we became hippie kids, and it was all because of a movie. And you know, my father started emulating Dennis Hopper, not Dennis Hopper, the iconic movie star Dennis Hopper, playing a character in a movie, and the values of that film you know, transfixed my parents and they ended up changing their lives. And so because of seeing that movie, you know, we went from being like upper middle class family to like poor, dirty hippie kids. And that informed me and my values for the rest of my life until I met the real life Dennis Hopper, who, <laughs> who I couldn't wait to like, you know, make fun of and tell him how much he'd ruined my life. And, you know, and I, I, I said to him, how many lives have you ruined, Dennis, with that film? And he laughed like, sorry. And isn't it true that this wasn't like just your family? Like many uh, people were affected by this. Yes. The, it's so sad that, that Dennis Hopper isn't, isn't here. I mean, he lives on in his great film roles, but I wanted to do a docu a documentary with him going around the country and because I said, I'm sure I'm not the only one. I yeah. mean, there are people out there riding motorcycles because of Peter Fonda. And everyone in the commune either looked like Peter Fonda or Dennis Hopper. Like, that was, you know, that was the, the, the look. And, and something about that movie spoke, you know, to these people. And I think that there was something within Dennis Hopper himself. He was an amazing photographer. He collected art. He went through these great ups and downs. He started out in the studio system. Um, you know, and then started making experimental films, changed the way independent filmmaking was made, and at the end of his career came back and made studio films and got this great, great, you know, success out of that. So, like, what a, first of all, what a kind of a career that he had. But I, I think he was truly an icon. But it shows how one movie sort of changed my life. But the, the story of my life unfolds through movies because I then while my parents were in this kind of easy rider movie I made the connection that my grandfather was like a black and white classic film star drinking champagne dancing with Greta Garbo that dichotomy is movie star and once I figured that out I was like oh I, I want to be when I want to be with my grandfather and he's talking to Jack Warden and Peter Sellers like that's the world I wanted to be in because that world you know involved food <laughs> involved like eating glamour there were chandeliers whereas your yeah. father sold yours yes yeah. Every, everything was like I wasn't old enough to appreciate like the hippie lifestyle you know I as a little kid it was like no I want TV and food and yeah. glamorous movie stars do you think it's possible for a movie to have an effect like that today well it's very interesting I you know I I think about a movie like you know Star Wars where it affects you but some of the morals of the film affect you but it's not like you believe you can go live on another planet right and I I do think that those kind of iconic movie stars don't um, exist anymore. I mean, you know, when I was a little kid, I, you know, I literally pretended that Richard Dreyfuss was my friend. You know, like he was my friend. I knew he was my friend. I you know, would see him yeah. in movies and, you know, I would somehow think, well, he's my, you know, he's my friend or I, so I just started emulating him and as a way to cope 
uh, with life or emulating Liza Minnelli as a way to cope with not wanting to be myself. Yeah. And I don't know, I mean, I think we see it with rock stars, like people identify with Lady Gaga or Taylor Swift or Beyonce, but I don't know if it's this in the, the power of film. And to me, film is the most powerful medium there is, the images. More so than TV. Oh yeah, there's just something about you know, it's the experience of being in, it's like, it's very church-like. You know, you're all faced in one direction. Yeah. It's in the dark. You're looking at these images, especially when you're young, which I talk about in, in the book. It's like wet cement. So any images you see, and all the first images I saw were like nudity, music, doomed romance, Romeo and Juliet, you know. Uh, but also, today, it's like going to the actual movie theater. Because today, if I'm at home and I'm loving movie, I'm still going to check my phone. Yeah. And so being forced not to check and only pay attention to the screen is so important. Yeah. And and letting those images, you know, sink in. That's why I love, you know, when they do the Turner Classic Film Festival and they show these old movies and you're there, you know, I remember one year the Cinerama Dome showed it's a mad, 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 mad world, you know, in, in 70 millimeter, you know, and you're never going to get a chance to yeah. see what that must have been like. And it was to have everybody laughing you know, like that with a film is just incredible. I don't know if we have those kind of experiences. Plus the idea that, you know, the digital nature of the film, again, our animal instincts know that it's not, like if you're watching Ben-Hur, you're like, whoa, whoa this, this is, these horses are kind of like, they're, something bad's gonna happen. But I feel like there's, we know that these are digital images that are not, as soon as they start flying, I'm like, I'm gone, I'm not interested. Oh, really? Yeah, as soon as the digital-ness kicks in, hmm. it is, it, it affects me. Whereas like if I'm watching um, Spartacus, you know, and you're like, oh, those are real people. Like each time the screen gets bigger, you see another thousand people. And there's a power in that that I don't think yeah. you can. And I think it's like the reverse too. The kids who grow up with these digital images, it makes it so obvious when they go back to watch the yeah. older ones. Yes. Whereas I'm able to appreciate both because I kind of like am in that like on the fence yeah. of my life. But the older uh, people or younger people, it's like, oh God, this is an old movie. Well, there's a. It's startling. Yeah, I, it's true. And with. Um, you know, it, it, the one thing that I didn't call accurately is when I started doing my own web series, we spent a lot of time trying to make it cinematic. And instead, you just saw the rise of the YouTube stars, very low tech personalities, yeah. just, just personalities. So it it's sad that we're not interested in the in the artisticness of it again like i feel like a little old school when we were in acting school oh my god sanford meisner if you weren't every night going out to see a broadway play or trying to get in the ballet or going to a museum you know trying to lift up your art in some way and so now it's a little jarring for me when you know you just say, oh all i need is a little microphone and a yeah and a camera and i can act wacky and you never know who is the person that is going to catch lightning in a bottle that that attracts someone i'm i find it fascinating but i miss the beauty of cinema is that why you've said before that like the art of filmmaking is dying yeah it, it i mean it absolutely it absolutely is. I mean, we don't have, first of all, we don't have the time. I, I was, you know, I remember in in the late 90s when it was, you know, you went, a shooting schedule used to be about 35 or 40 days, and then it went to 30 days, and then it went to 20 days, and then now we're at making, we're making movies in 17 days. It's yeah. that fast. Yeah, and you don't have the time to, uh, rehearse discuss images you know i know with my own directing career and things that i've directed and the film that i'm going to be directing now i mean i'm pre-planning in my head because i know that the shooting schedule like there's not going to be a lot of time so i've got to have i want to have all my images you know beforehand but that's not to say that people should give up i mean i don't give up yeah. on on trying to you know have my own aesthetic and I mean, you look at, I mean, look at Quentin Tarantino and Wes Anderson and, 
you know, there are people out there. I, I, I mean, I think Mad Men had a wonderful aesthetic. Wonderful. But it's so funny. Then I watch a show. Like, there's a show out now. I'm like, oh, derivative of Mad Men, which Mad Men was derivative of the man in the gray flannel suit and a bunch of other 50s. So we can't just be derivative of other things. Yeah. I hate that networks are like, oh, we want a Mad Men. I'm like, just do something great. Yeah. Don't try to copy like like ugly. We want a Glee. Glee's big, you know. Yeah, exactly. So, so they make so you have five shows that uh, you know are not quite as good as the uh, original one. But it's hard. It's hard. I mean, it's very very challenging to try to make something beautiful in the midst of why should I make this beautiful when this guy has five million followers and he's getting all these licensing deals. Yeah. For if I were a young person, I'd be like Ileana. Grandma, <laughs> grandma, no, <laughs> you're wrong. Okay, because he's getting all the endorsement deals. Oh my God. Um, before I let you go, uh, uh, you've wrote about like all the biggest stars in here we, as we named them. Uh, who, what do you have left for your second book? Oh, there were so many stories. Really? We had I had an entire uh, chapter that killed me that didn't make it in called uh, "Never Eat Pasta for Lunch." and other things I've learned from directors. Uh, I, was, I had stories about John Frankenheimer, uh, Elizabeth Taylor, uh, Roman Polanski, just in my travels of, you know, of meeting people. So I, I, I certainly have more stories. And I feel also like every day I'm, I'm cattle, you know, when I'm talking to people, I always try to, if I've read something in a book, I try to verify um, a new story. I'll, gi I'll give you an example. Like I'm, um, I could not be more excited about this. Is that for Turner Classic Movies, I'm going to be interviewing Dick Cavett. So when I was a little kid, Dick Cavett was the first person I ever got his autograph from. Wow. <laughs> and so I saw him. I was. That's when I was working at the Hartford Stage Company, and I. I saw he was at the mall, I think, doing some like book talk or whatever. And I literally came and I didn't have his book because, of course, I couldn't afford to buy his book. But I had a Marx Brothers book. <laughs> it's like, there must have been such a complete idiot. Like, will you send my Marx Brothers book? And I think he kind of gave me shit for that. But he saw it. I was like, well, there, you're there and I know you like Groucho. Like, yeah, okay, kid. Maybe you'll grow <laughs> up and buy my book. So, but he signed and he signed like a little funny thing. So, I'm going to be interviewing Dick Cavett and I got my book. Oh, you still have it? Of wow. I, of course I do. So, I have the book. I'll tell the story and uh, and then I'll and then I'll be like all the people that go to Jerry Lewis. Do you remember this? It was 1980. We you were in the mall. Wait, did Turner Classic know this when they booked him? No, no. You're kidding. No, no, no. My 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 whole career is based on as I said, like I love that there's the job, but then there's also the little kid in me that goes, "Oh my god. Wait till I bring out my book, my Dick Cavett." Book. I feel like young actors and actresses will watch this being like, oh, how can I have her career? And they're like, oh, this is not replicable yeah. at all. Yeah. <laughs> if you're excited about meeting Dick Cavett so you can show him your uh, your autograph book from when you were 13, you know. But that, but I, I still get he he's he's such a great he's a great interviewer and his shows are are, you know, they're the best that they're like they're, you know, on if you can watch them on YouTube. There's so much on YouTube. But the problem is no one's curating them. And I think that what I try to do with my interviews is curate them. So if I'm interviewing Peter Bogdanovich, I have worked with Peter Bogdanovich three times. I've worked with him as an actor, uh, just in a film. We acted together. He's directed me. And so I have, you know, Richard, same thing with Richard Dreyfus. I watched Richard Dreyfus. Uh, as a child and then studied him and then worked with him, worked opposite him in a film. So I think that it's like that inside outside um, is what I think is kind of unique. Cause I'm still like, I'm like everybody, I'm like a movie fan of like, I got, I, I've got to somehow get to these difficult questions that maybe they don't want to answer or whatever. I've got that in the back of my head. But but my approach, I feel like, is a little bit different because I'm like the movie fan who somehow got in the movie. Yeah, you're like the movie <laughs> fan that they trust because they've seen her on screen also. Yeah, I'm like everyone's sister. I'm like everyone's irritating sister, which I was <laughs> and still am. So that's on Turner Classic Movies as yes. well as your podcast? Are you interviewing yes. people? 
Okay. Yeah, uh, Turner Classic Movies is is a, a great, uh, just a wonderful side job. We just had our uh, the Trailblazing Women series, which is on every October, and we did actresses this year. It was just incredible. Bette Midler, Jane Fonda, oh my God, Rita Moreno, Jane Alexander, all people that again that I had watched and are, had. Are you showing their films? Or are you interviewing them? Both. Oh, amazing. Both. They That's come so on, much fun. Yeah, they come on as as co-hosts, and we watch uh, five films a night. And we talk about each film, we sort of give it an intro, but included in the night would be one of their films. So for Rita, Rita Moreno, it was West Side Story, with Jane Fonda, it was um, uh, The China Syndrome. And so it was amazing to have to, wow. to get to talk to, yeah, all these people who had such a, I mean, they were just so much a part of my, you know, childhood and meeting these people is so incredible for me. Wow. Uh, you know. But as I said, I got so many more uh, uh, Peter I've got great Peter O'Toole stories. He was a great Oh my god, something to look forward to. Yes. Well, yes. this was so much fun. Thank you Thank very much. You. Thank yeah. You. Um, if people want to download your podcast, it's on iTunes. Yes, it is. And should they check you on your website? Where's the best place? Well, they can go. Um, well, first of all, you can get the book on Amazon. Uh, I blame uh, Dennis Hopper, and you can find me on Twitter at Ileana Rama, and you can download the podcast too. I blame Dennis Hopper, which is on iTunes. We're just kind of gearing up, but we've had some great people already cool. um, and it's specifically talking about film and the passions of making film the process of making film oh that's so off brand for you yes <laughs> and ho well hopefully it helps people you know it's not just about the business of film it's about the pat because you need the passion of filmmaking yeah I think to get you through um, and that's what I hope to inspire the people that have inspired me all my life. I hope I, you know, carry on that that tradition, that that passion to other people because I know how challenging it is to, you know. But it's not just about the getting the agent. Everybody's like, how do you get an agent? It's like, write a good script, <laughs> you know, like make something good. Then you get an agent, you know. Yeah. All right. So, well, thank you so much thank for this. Thank you. Yeah. Um, we'll be back next week. You can find all of our content on iTunes, YouTube, and of course, bookcircleonline.com. Bye. From managing editor Jason Squamata, executive producers Maria Menunos, Phil Svitek, and Kevin Undergaro, we would like to thank you for tuning in to Book Circle Online. For more discussion, go to bookcircleonline.com. And if you have comments, questions, or book title suggestions, write us at info at bookcircleonline.com. I'm Sir Richard Wentworth, and this is Book Circle Online. BCO, join the circle.